You're listening to The Powerful Creator Show with your host, Cheryl Sosnowski. If you can conceive it and believe it, you can achieve it. And now, here's your host, Cheryl Sosnowski. Hello, Christopher. Thank you for joining me on The Powerful Creator Show. Awesome. Very, very thrilled to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. I start off every episode by asking the same question, and it is what it means to you to be a powerful creator. Mm, A powerful creator. Well, for me, at at some level, I've always thought that life, or at least my life, and possibly everybody's is about creation. It's about learning to manifest our, our greatest dreams. And so to become a powerful creator is to become the highest divine expression of yourself that you could possibly be so that you may manifest those dreams. It's not the only reason, but um, I think that life is all about evolution. And so uh, for me, it's, it's becoming the person who can make your every dream come true. Mm-hmm. Becoming the person who can make your own every dream come true. Uh, to make the impact that you want to make in, in your lifetime. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. How did you fall into that kind of mindset? Um, you know, I think I was, born with it, I'll say, but um, I don't say that in an egotistical way. I just, uh, maybe we all are, you know, Uh, but it's been in, since the time I was a kid, I had an image, for example, branded into my mind of where I would one day live. And the, you know, there was, and I've still got that image and I'm not, I'm kind of in that place now, but not quite perfect. And so uh, it's, it's just always been there and it's been like a driving force for me. And I think that the visions that we hold in our mind become driving forces for what we ultimately create. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I've improved. I've I've grown my skills over the years and things like that. Done lots of personal and professional development. And uh, so I'm always leveling up from that perspective. I love that. Uh, We're completely aligned in that philosophy. So tell me about living into your vision and how you drive and operate that from your life for your own life. Um, for me, it's it's always been a, a result or, or been a a process of uh, ameliorating my mindset and ameliorating my skill set. So I've been a martial artist all my life. Started when I was ten years old in martial mm-hmm. arts. I turned fifty one in two days. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so I've been a martial artist all my life, and and that was always about the discipline, the discipline of showing up. The person who gets the black belt isn't the person who read the book on martial arts. It's not the mm-hmm. person who saw the DVD on the martial arts. It's the person who did the work day in, day out, had the discipline to improve the skill set and improve the level of artistry with which they practiced. And for me, the artistry of living uh, requires the same discipline, uh, the same desire to improve one's mindset and one's skill set. So for me, every day that I'm showing up and I'm in advancing on that, that front is a day that I'm winning. And mm. Uh, you know, because bank accounts may come and go, rise and fall, businesses right. may come and go, um, but who you are uh, remains through it all or has the potential of either advancing or falling in terms of your mindset, and your skills. And so for me, who you are is more important than, than anything else. Um, mm. uh, the, I, I love Warren Buffett's uh, saying, he said, the tide may rise, the tides may fall, but when the, tide, when the tide goes out, you get to see who's been swimming naked. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and, you know, there's some of us that'll swim naked through life. I've certainly caught myself in positions like that, where I found I was swimming naked and I, I realized it because I got burned in some way. Um, mm. and so how we show up, who we are, our character, all those things are going to uh, matter more in the long run than anything else. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. And I just heard a quote literally just this morning and somebody said, um, hearing the word water does not make you wet. And I was like, that's a really interesting, exactly what you just said. It's like, you can read about it. You can know about it. You can think about it, but until you actually jump in, you're not going to get it. So how I love the correlation between martial arts and that discipline of martial arts carrying over like all these years into the philosophy of who you are and shaping who you are. What about, how do you, cause I, I kind of know what you do a little bit. So we'll dive into that with you, how you help drive people to get into this space of excellence. How do you tap into that feeling? What is that feeling or that knowing that driving? Can you describe that energy that senses you to strive for that sense of excellence for yourself? 
Um, hmm, interesting question. Um, how do I tap into that drive or what? Um, or what does it feel like? Yeah. What does it feel like? Um, it's, it's just kind of been an, an innate knowingness and a, uh, uh, and I think it was just drilled into my head when in martial arts that you, you show up and you do the work. I remember when I was, when I was young, I had a militant martial arts instructor when I first started and I, I wouldn't train with anybody like that today, but interestingly enough, it instilled that discipline. Um, I remember I was doing a, a nunchaku kata, nunchucks, where, and I remember when I was, I was probably 14 years old and I hit my shin and I saw the blood seeping through my gi pants, but there was no, back then with this guy, when I was training with him, there was no option. It's not like I could stop and go, oh, I hit my shin. I had to keep going. And that was just the no excuse attitude that he kind of mm. drilled into me. Today, I do uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I kind of advanced into a different art, which is uh, a flowing art, more of a grappling type art. Uh, and the philosophies are different, but, uh, you know, and equally potent, equally powerful. One instilled the discipline, one instilled just the, the flowing nature of life. And, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, both are real important in terms of attitudes with which to approach life. Um, the, the desire to practice something until it becomes exquisite I think is innate in, um, in many, I, you know, a lot of the people that I looked up to uh, when I was young, I, I, I admired people like Bruce Lee. I admired people like Elvis Presley. I admired people that excelled in what it was that they did mm. so much so that they became iconic in our minds. But what made them iconic was this search for being the best at what they did in this, this quest to be the best. I believe when you're the best in the world, there's always a market for you. And I don't say that in a competitive way in relationship to other people. I mean it in terms of your, the, the desire to be exquisite, the mm. desire to, you look at Michael Jackson or, you know, if we ignore a lot of the uh, surrounding circumstances and you look at the, the desire to be extraordinary, um, I think that that really causes people to stand out in ways that um, that allow there to always be a market for them. And mm, yeah, I think if we take that approach to life, uh, we become really uh, great. Now, but I also uh, think back to the book, The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho, mm. um, where it's all about following your, manifesting your heart's desire or following your personal legend, doing what you were born to do. Right. And there's a statement in that book where he says, love is what makes all things great. Love is what transforms lead into gold in our life, the, the mm -hmm. magic of alchemy. And for me, the love of, uh, you know, pouring your love into becoming incredible is what gives you opportunities. The millionaire isn't a millionaire because they've got a, a million dollars in the bank. The millionaire has a million dollars in the bank because of who they are. Mm. They, you know, they became the person who earned the million dollars in the bank or, if you look at any exquisite performer in, in arts or, you know, whether it be singing performers or actors or they, they perfect often, oftentimes, not always, but perfect their craft and, and become extraordinary. And that and when people shine, uh, it's hard not to recognize that. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean, what you're talking about. It's that at honing that essence that's within you, that is truly authentic to who you are, that even there, there could be two people doing the same thing who are both exquisite, but there's a place for both of them in sure. showing up in their authenticity as best uh -huh. as they can. Yeah, and it's yeah. that, I think it's that quest uh, of transforming, it's like modern day alchemy, right? Transforming lead into gold yeah. in terms of who you become. And, and I think it's always, you know, we, we've heard before that life is about being, doing, and having. And if you're being who you need to be, you'll do and take the actions that you need to take to have and create whatever it is that you want. Right. Having, creating is, is a happenstance of your beingness. And so uh, I think it all comes back to who we're being. 100%. Yeah, it, it does. So I love, 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 love that you touched on. Um, to me, it feels like the masculine energy is the creator, doer, pusher, you know, that energy. And then, but you also are tapped into the feminine energy of the receiving, allowing, flowing. And I love hearing when um, men, especially with the masculine energy, are tapping into that. And can you share how? you feel that serves you 
and other other men or other women even who are want to show up in the in the world in a more impactful way. Right. Um, I, I had to learn it the hard way um, <laughs> because we can try to will things into existence and to make them happen and to control people and circumstances, but that oftentimes will only get us so far. Mm. Uh, I, for me, it happened because I had become such a so so much of a human doing rather than a human being that I, I pushed myself to the point of burnout. I pushed myself to the point of collapse, and that's oftentimes the way that it happens. We have to break down to break through. Right. And, um, I, at one point I had, I was looking for answers desperately because I was stressed out. I was pushed to the limit. And much of that came because of the need to try to control things and to make things happen. And so finally I popped and I thought, you know, you need to learn a new way to do things. And I liken it, the, the metaphor of gardening. You know, if you're planting a garden, you can't will a flower to grow to a certain height or um, you know, uh, force something to grow in the way that you want. You work with the forces of nature. You plant the seeds at the right time. You water them, you nurture them. As the plants begin to grow, it's like a bonsai tree. You don't force it into a certain shape. You work with what you're given. Mm. And so, and then you reveal the beauty of what it is. And so uh, from that perspective, I think we could look at life as being more of a, a co-creation with God or the universe or whatever you want to call it where we're, we're working with the forces of nature instead of becoming the force of nature. And I think that mm. that's where uh, we have the, the ability to make things manifest that we would never have otherwise. And the difference between creation and manifestation, manifestation is simply calling forth that which already exists at some level, like, the, like Michelangelo revealing David from, the, the, you know, from the, the stone in which he was encased. Right. Reveal what's there. And that's, that's a working with rather than a doing to in a forceful nature. Yeah, uh, that's a really good analogy. And it's true. And it, it feels like now, I'm, it feels like the energy is shifting into a much more um, mindful, philosophical, spiritual bent, even in, for people in the business world, that it's kind of changing over to recognize these laws of mind and the laws of the universe, the, law, the invisible laws that are governing all of our lives that we don't necessarily see, but we know that they're there. How are you tapping into those and what tips would you share for tapping into those? If somebody is like just figuring this out, if they're at that broken point where they're like, wow, I really got to do something different, but they have no idea what that something different is. Mm, wow. Um, you're making me think. Um, <laughs> I do that. <laughs> uh, <you> do that. <laughs> well, I, think, um, I, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying in terms of uh, the world waking up more to it. And even in, you know, an environment that might be more uh, almost, if we think of it as masculine and feminine, that might be more masculine in nature being right. on, you know, we think of that type of environment, which oftentimes the corporate world forces us to, to shift into those gears. Um, we, that's also where we get the challenges that we have of pushing ourselves to early illness or becoming uh, that human doing rather than the human being. I had a, a friend of mine, um, his name's Leon, and he had worked uh, as a CFO for, or chief financial officer for a bunch of Fortune 100 companies. And he got to the point where he was so sick with what was happening from an ethical perspective inside the corporations and just so burnt out and exhausted from that way of being, from just doing, 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 that he popped and uh, he, he moved. Uh, I met him in Bali um, because I had popped and I moved to Bali and many people do. And <laughs> I grew my hair long. I was riding my motorcycle through the rainforest and let go of all my attachment. And oh, he nice. came out there. And you couldn't even mention corporation again, or you couldn't mention company, you couldn't mention business without him getting triggered, right? Mm -hmm. And um, which he, which pointed out what he needed to heal within himself as well. Right. But I think it's, you know, if I think that that way of living can push us into extremes when, and, and so I apologize. If That's okay. You, you know, it must be people calling for advice. Um, <laughs> and going, Dang it, I need to find out about this, you know. Um, but we push ourselves uh, to extremes and some people find it alarming um, <laughs> that, uh, that they've been pushed to this point. And, and, you know, unfortunately, we sometimes have to get to that point before we're willing to do something about it until we graduate to a, a new level of consciousness. 
uh, because if we could uh, if we could learn new ways of being, we wouldn't have to get to that point first. Um, the, you know, there's for me, it's a value shift. And I don't know if you're familiar with the spiral dynamics model or um, comes out of the National Values Center and, and Claire Graves work. And he talks about uh, different value systems of thought. Values level five is very achievement oriented, goal oriented. And what happens is you hit a point where the insufficiencies of that value system to deal with the world cause an evolution of thought or an evolution of values. And so people get to that point where they hit early illness or they push themselves to an extreme or they have a heart attack or they, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And it goes, oh, wow, I need to let go of that way of thinking. And they become more socially minded and it becomes less about what do I achieve and more about who am I in relationship to the world or other people. Um, and they, they start wearing Birkenstocks and they eat brown rice and they move to Bali or Sedona <laughs> or they, you know, they, and they, and it becomes about the community and it becomes about, uh, you know, good feelings amongst people. And there's a tremendous, there's great learnings in that value system, which mm -hmm. is more, it's no longer the external quest to see what I create is the internal quest to see who I become. And they uh, meditate and they sit on the rock for uh, hours on end and they look into people's eyes and they feel the connection. And so this is a whole different value system. This value system has its challenges as well. And, uh, you know, within this value system, there's not a lot of results that get produced because the results aren't as important. Right. And, and then people hit up against the insufficiencies of that value system. They go, wait a second, I'm not getting the results that I want. Many people live hand to mouth because money is just not important. It's not about what we create. It's about who we are. Right. And you get another evolution of thought, which is what the National Value Center or Spiral Dynamics would call values level seven, which would be a more of a results oriented value system where values level seven still recycles, still cares about the planet, but they're more results oriented. So they maintain the learnings and the lessons of the previous value systems and, um, and community is still important in connection with people, but they're also very, uh, they can get things done as well from a material world perspective. So I think it's really more than anything, it's a marriage of thought. People think mm -hmm. that you have to be one or the other that you right. have to yeah, care about the self and be meditative or be action oriented and get things done. But when we blend these philosophies together, we come to a higher level of understanding and, and more inspired action so that we can act, but be at the same time. Wonderful. I've never actually heard of that value, values model. I know of a couple of other ones, but I haven't heard of that yeah. one, but I really like that. And uh, when you were saying that, it made me think of a uh, a saying that I came up with like a year or two ago, where I was like, you don't have to be a hippie to hug a tree. You could still hug a tree. <laughs> right? Yeah. No, and I was, I was in a clubhouse room the other day and, uh, and on that app, the new social media app. Yeah. I love and, it. Yeah. And somebody was in there and the advice that somebody gave them from the panel was go hug some trees. I want you to hug some trees. And they were being really sincere. And usually we think of tree hugging as being, uh, something that uh, people will kind of lampoon a bit, but it's like, they're just talking about becoming, you know, feeling nature, being at one in nature. Yeah. I had great lessons and learnings that came from when I moved to Bali, I moved to the rainforest and grew my hair long. There's tremendous learnings that you get from that. And the person who's more of the doer, which we would say values level five, but it's achievement oriented, goal oriented is the Olympic athlete, but it's the same time the corporate executive that's pushing to be the best, that person will fight tooth and nail not to go into that other value system because it's the <laughs> antithesis of everything they believe Totally, in. yeah. But the lessons that are there, therein lies true fulfillment. Yeah. And, and true fulfillment doesn't come in the pursuit of material goods, but people don't realize that. So it, it comes in the inner quest. And so when we can bridge those two and, and realize that they not only can coexist, but can enhance each other. Mm. I think that's where we, we get the magic. Yeah. Many years ago, I was in Maui and uh, we went and did a, uh, a Haleakala bike ride where you they, the guy picks you up super early in the morning, drives you up to the top of the volcano and leaves. So he's done working by like 6 a.m. so he could go surfing. And so when we're driving up the mountain, he points at this bus, this little school bus, and he goes, Oh yeah, that's my bus. And I was like, I'm like, what do you mean? That's my bus. He goes, that's where I live. That's my bus, ma'am. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow. And at the time I was a corporate executive and I was like, and part of me just thought I looked at my 
friend, my um, boyfriend at the time I was with, and I said, you know, maybe this guy's got something figured out here that, that I don't. And it was actually, but it's, I love the marriage of those two because it's, um, you know, now that I've married those two sides of myself, I feel like the, the inner contentment, the inner peace, the inner joy, it's like, it's converse that the more that I empty myself out, the more filled I become and the more amazing people and experiences and finances and everything else, I just flow, flow so much easier. Yeah. That, and that flow, I think is so important in terms of, of creating it's, it's, um, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and it's fascinating to see the places where people get stuck. It's fascinating to look back on my life and the places where I've been stuck. And, um, and it's also cool to understand that there's solutions to all of these things and, um, and that it is possible to be fulfilled while we're creating and to be in mm. flow and um, yeah, to, not get, to not get stuck. But to, I think to a large extent, we sleepwalk through life and we're unconscious of the patterns that, uh, that grip us. And we may be stuck in, in, a, in a value system and then just wonder, you know, in the one, the doingness uh, we, and we're never fulfilled because we're looking for something outside of ourselves and that's mm -hmm. not where you find it. Um, uh, or in the other one where we're really fulfilled and we're just connecting with people and we're, but we're living hand to mouth and we're not right. really getting ahead or we're not really, uh, making the impact that we could be making if yeah. we were to get, uh, if we were to marry, uh, thought systems and ideologies. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I think that that's, you know, in our modern world, in our modern society, not many people want to go live in a hut and eat bananas, you know? <laughs> I do. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> I, mean, I would if I could, as long right. as it had nice sheets and a comfortable pillow at night, I think I'd be okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, funny. Let me ask you, who do you serve, Christopher? Who do I serve? Mm -hmm. Um. Mm. Well, I mean, there's the answers that immediately come. I mean, I could, you know, that's like, what could I say? But when you like, I'm going to challenge myself with that question. Who do I serve? I mean, I think, you know, it's, when you ask me that, it's like I get all these bubblegum answers that come to my head and I want to uh, make sure that it's authentic. Um, you know, at some level, I think we all serve all that there is because uh, if, I, I do believe that uh, at some level we're all one and that there's microcosm and macrocosm. So in self and serving, uh, so I'm serving God, I'm serving the universe, I'm serving people, but at the same time, I'm serving myself. Um, Mother Teresa was once asked, how do you live amongst the abject poverty that you find yourself in? And she said, when I look into the eyes of everybody, I see the eyes of God reflected mm -hmm. back at me. And so who do I serve? I mean, you know, who don't I serve? I suppose one could say. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I think, I think people get caught up in the notion that, um, that if they follow their heart's desire, um, that they're somehow, that's somehow selfish, but, uh, you know, I believe that your heart's desire and God's will are one and the same. And that we're meant to follow our heart's desire. There's a reason why, uh, you know, that voice comes from within. That's our soul's calling. Um, and people then will take me to task and say, what if, you know, there's evil, nasty people that do evil, nasty things out right. there. That doesn't, you know, your heart's desire is your pure desire from within. It's not, uh, and, and, and I think there's always things that we can learn from an ethical perspective in terms of how to operate in a way that doesn't just serve us, but serves our family, serves our communities, serves uh, mankind on a larger level, serves the planet, serves the universe. If we're making sure that our actions are for the highest good of all these things, then uh, you know we're, we're operating in ways that are uh, ultimately from a karmic perspective, from an ethical perspective, going to reap the greatest rewards and the greatest results. And, and that's mm -hmm. the, probably the purest uh, the purest calling of the soul is when we're operating in higher level ways. Wonderful. Yeah, I agree with you. It's, I like, I just, I love your philosophy and your alignment and the discipline piece I think is so important and is a lot of people aren't, under, aren't getting that piece of the pie or that piece of the puzzle where they're like law of attraction. How come I'm not getting what I want? I'm like, what are you doing about it? <laughs> if you're sitting on the couch, you're attracting certain things, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, no, it's, um, and, uh, you know, I've had 
conversations with the uh, the biggest experts in the field, people na whose names everybody would know. And there's different types of thought uh, processes. The people that are most seasoned, though, that have been around the longest, will uh, typically say that even you know the, the attraction has the word action in it. The bridge between the world of thought and the world of material result is action. So we've got to take inspired action to produce results. You know, oftentimes the um, I think people in esoteric circles will will overlook the magic of creation in the material world. And right. you know, to build a dream is is not rocket science, but sometimes common sense is not all that common. We if we want to build a house, we dream it, we have the vision, we hire the right architect that's built that type of house before, we hire the right building team. We pour, it's, we, we've heard that it, where attention goes, energy flows and results mm -hmm. show. We pour our attention, but we also have to pour, pour our attention in a way that actually produces a result. And, and so we go through those steps and pretty soon the house is in front of us. The house doesn't appear simply because we're meditating on it. Right. It appears because we're taking these steps that cause a house to appear. So there's, and, and it's physical, but there's physical laws for manifestation and creation as well that need to be, adhered to in order for mm. manifestation to occur. So yeah, I always say we just have to look to nature. Nature takes its time. It's unfolding. We just aren't seeing it. We can come outside a month later and go, oh wow, my flowers have sprouted. But if you sit there staring at them every day, you're not going to notice any changes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's not because we meditate and imagine in a flower that the flower appears in the garden. The seeds right. have to be sown. The, yes. You know, all the all the steps have to be taken to to make that manifest. In that day, in your daily actions, and I always say, I'm like my greatest successes have come from learning to say no to myself. <laughs> uh, interesting. Yeah. So it's like it's the uh, the uh, vacuum law of prosperity, right? So nature abhors a vacuum. If right. You want to, new clothes, the first thing you need to do is clean out your closet and make room for them. So there are things that we have to say no to uh, along the way. And cut yeah, out. exactly. So Christopher, who do you work with? Who's your ideal client that you like to work with? Um, you know, I've, I've been in the field of personal development for 25 years. I've helped to build many, many, many uh, million dollar plus trainers, coaches, authors, consultants, educators over the years. So I train coaches, I train speakers, I train consultants. Um, my specialty is helping people to facilitate or to have and to create performance breakthroughs physically, emotionally, spiritually, and financially. So I am a, a coach that helps people to unleash their full potential. Um, so from that perspective, anybody that wants to unleash their full potential, but the, I'd say that the sweet spot on the diving board for me uh, would be uh, life purpose type issues, helping people to turn their passions into profit, those types of things. I've worked with everything across the board from uh, helping uh, people with healing and I've worked with things like cancer. I've worked with uh, people that have had ritual abuse. I've worked with anything you could possibly imagine, um, but uh, life purpose issues and uh, manifesting one's life vision and, and monetizing it. And that sort of thing is typically where I, I, I find that I have the most potency. Wonderful. And how can people find you? You're just so inspiring. And I, you strike me as, um, well, in the term, in the, the printing world, in the paper world, I used to work in as WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. And you definitely I, strike me as being that way. And I appreciate that about you. So how can people find you who want to work with you? Um, well, I've got free courses that I run. I've got a free challenge that's coming up. And once that goes, there'll be another one. You can always find whatever I'm offering is free and check it out soon because there may be something upcoming is at wealthpropulsion.com. So it's www.wealthpropulsion.com for our upcoming free course. And then I've also got a uh, free resource for uh, anybody that wants to amplify their message. Uh, and it's called speakandgrowrich365.com. So it's www.speakandgrowrich365.com. And that's a, a email-based course where every day you get a new a component that helps you to build yourself as a speaker, amplify your message. Uh, and it also teaches you about the business of getting it out there as well. Awesome. And I will have both of those links down below this video and the podcast links and all that good stuff. And I sure appreciate your time and being here and you're just a fascinating person. And I'm glad that I got to connect with you. Thank you. Yeah, you as well. I'll have to look you up when I come out to Australia, or I almost said Australia, out to <laughs> Arizona, Arizona, Australia. Same thing, Down right? under. <laughs> 
It's a pleasure. <laughs> you too. Thank you. You've been listening to The Powerful Creator Show with Cheryl Sosnowski. Subscribe at iTunes or go to PowerfulCreatorShow.com and join our email list so you never miss a future episode. Have a powerfully creative day.